So I'm here with uh, Diane Miller, who, uh, as I read from her website, describes herself as a singer, a rapper, looper, beatboxer, songwriter, and guitarist. And we should probably add booking agent as well to that mix. Yeah. Uh, yeah, welcome. Thanks for chatting with me. Thanks for having me, Ben. Are you from Fargo? Did you grow up there? Or? I Yeah, I'm from Fargo, North Dakota. I, um, I've lived there from like 1997 or 1998 to like, um, what, 2018. So with like some, with a, like one bout of living in the Twin Cities sometime in there. But yeah, it's Fargo Moorhead is mostly where I'm from. And I've lived in Minneapolis since 2018. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> so did you and did, did you move to Minneapolis um, first for music or for school or how did that? Yeah, I I got offered the job at Ice House. I'd been wanting to um, move to Minneapolis for a while, and then I got offered the job at Ice House, and I was immediately took it and said yes. And um, um, and, but also the community for music here is quite a bit. Um, a lot more vibrant than in, in Fargo. I mean, it's just the, so I've always looked up to the Minneapolis music scene as like a, a being kind of a mecca for artists and um, and just great music that comes out of the city. So um, as someone who's been a performer for how many years, um, it's, I've like had Minneapolis on my mind for many, many years. Um, and I love it here. And I'm glad that I, I made the move. I was going to say, I, since I've, I've been to Fargo several times now, because my, my partner, um, her family is, you know, her parents live there. Uh, and mm -hmm. it I basically, I the only image I had prior to that of Fargo was like the movie. And it's obviously, it, doesn't, <laughs> it looks nothing like that anyway. Uh, but were there, like, what were the venues, um, the live music venues there like when you were growing up? Were there a lot of... Mm -hmm. Um, places for hip hop and spoken word, or not so much, or there was there was the one kind of go to spot in Fargo called the Aquarium. I mean, there's lots of places to play around there, but as far as like a, um, a venue that brings in indie and like different types of music and um, from all across um, the country the aquarium was like kind of a go-to space for for a lot of artists and musicians and it was like it's a favorite for for a lot of local bands to play because it's a really it's set up for music you know it's set up for people to go and watch and rather than just like playing at the corner of a bar <laughs> so um yeah we're lucky to have a space like the aquarium um in fargo and it's still doing its thing um i booked there for um, a couple of years before before moving to Minneapolis, I actually was a booker of that venue, and um, yeah, it's, um, that's where a lot of my I hosted some of my own original shows there, and went to see bands like Band of Horses and the Melvins, and just um, uh, Sharon Van Eaton. Like all these amazing artists have come through that venue as well. So, um, so yeah, there are places, and I mean, I mean, there's bigger venues, there's smaller venues. It's um, it's all across the board. The, there's a music scene that exists, and and it definitely helps keep the community alive and, and vibrant. And there's a lot of talented artists out there too. So, big time. My impression was that most or all of your group, uh, D Mill and the Thrills, is from Fargo, or you guys formed in Fargo, or how did yes, that first that, start? Um, all from Fargo. Um, yeah, we. You mentioned Tom Johnson. Um, we had our own like kind of folky project, um, and I was playing in a band called Haley and the Red Dells, and we kind of I just kind of knew people in the scene. I was a music major in college and there was just a random like hip hop event called hip hop. Don't stop. And, and, and I reached out to the people who were putting on that event and I was like, Hey, can I perform at this? And 
yeah, so they added me on for this event at the Fargo VFW basement and um, Tom helped me like put, reach out to this um, a local reggae band and we just basically formed like said, hey, here's the chords and and started playing these really simple <laughs> And we just laid a groove down and then I started rapping and that that's kind of how it started and hmm. it ended up being a success. And then we ended up doing more shows and people just like loved it. Um, I mean, we're kind of, it's kind of a novelty in, in Fargo. I mean, there are rappers and there's a hip hop scene there, but it's, um, but you don't really, people don't really necessarily meld Fargo and hip hop. And it just doesn't really make sense for a lot of people. <laughs> But, but we made it work and, um, and, and yeah, we, we had a lot of success and, um, a lot of followers and, um, and I think people enjoyed the live music aspect of it. Cause a lot of times you see, um, bands with DJs or hip hop acts with DJs. And here we were putting like, or ha having this like female lead singer, and then, and then backed by a full like six piece band with featuring some of the best uh, musicians in Fargo. Um, so it was just like a recipe for success. It was, um, and, and we, we went on to do a lot of, we wrote our own music, but we'd also like perform fun tributes to bands and um, we covered everything from outcast to tribe called quest and um tlc and yeah and it's we're still going we um next year will be our 10 year anniversary with d mills and the thrills um wow. yeah and now that i live here obviously it's a, a lot harder for them to travel because um i mean they have full-time jobs and have kids and so, I mean, we've, I mean, it's not quite the same, but um, my bass player and drummer will travel up here and, and play some shows with me here. And we've, <clears throat> we've done one, we did an awesome show at the Fine Line Cafe, opening for Mark Rebley. And um, we've done shows at 331 Club. Um, so yeah, I, I'm still playing with those guys and we still want to put on shows in Fargo. It's been obviously a little bit harder to do that now that COVID is, <laughs> yeah, we were supposed to have a show in, in May, but it got canceled. So mm -hmm. we were supposed to have a show in May and, um, at the aquarium with a grandma's boyfriend who are from uh, Twin Cities, of course, and then um, a band called Free Truman. Hmm. So, uh, yeah. It's hard. Yeah. What, what, uh, what are your thoughts? thoughts because i'm sure it changes week to week like what are your thoughts right now on how you guys can collaborate either virtually or you know are you are you thinking about putting on um like socially distant shows outside yeah um, what's that process like at the moment i mean yeah we might do i might do like an outdoor show um and have it have that be safe enough for where people can socially distance. Um, right now I'm more focusing on recording music than I am with live playing. So, and I'm working, and I'm, um, I'm working with a bunch of different artists. And it's not necessarily going to be all like, D-Mills and the Thrills. It's going to be me working with different artists and putting out my first solo record. So, um, featuring, a showcase of different producers and different um, talents and see what that ends up sounding like. So um, it's tricky because you want to be safe and you want to be, um, you know, I was just in the studio today and I just wore a mask, mm. you know, when I was, when we were in the same room, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. I noticed I, part one of the reasons that I, I thought of you is is that um, like early on in the in the shutdown in the stay at home order, you were you were probably like one of the first people in my you know social media 
feed oh, cool. that was doing live streams and it seemed yeah. at one point like you were doing it like every day you had this really <laughs> consistent routine and even featured your mom which i thought was was pretty cool so did it was a good outlet to like because at the time when i i remember like you know we had to quarantine i, I mean i had this lifestyle going out almost every night to see live music and working for ice house that's kind of like what your life becomes is like going out and supporting live music hearing more you know it's checking out bands and and then to go from that to being like staying at home and not being able to go out like i i was it started as an experiment um the first time i did a live because i'd never live streamed myself before and hmm. I was like why not um and then I ended up having so much fun and it was really relaxed. It was just like me playing covers basically and just singing songs and not, not having it be too formal. And um, yeah, and it ended up being just a really good escape. Um, and so I did it a number of times and then I kind of slowed down and um, it, but yeah, it's not it. And then I did another one recently and it, it, it really is a kind of hard. It's, <laughs> You want to, it's not the same as performing to a live audience, that's for sure. It's, it's difficult. You have to watch yourself the whole time. <laughs> I know, I feel like that it has certain elements of, of like the worst of recording added in where you're constantly mm -hmm. monitoring yourself and, and kind of self-conscious. Yeah. If you're not used to it, you know, and I. I yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah. and to know it's just live, you know, like you can record yourself and be like, Oh, I don't like this take. I'm not going to, but the whole time you're live and mm -hmm. all your mistakes just lay out and just like, okay, well, here I am. Um, but I mean, it, it's at least one outlet for musicians to figure out, you know, mm -hmm. perform live again, you know, I think it's interesting too because you it seems like you do a lot of um like live looping um and mm -hmm. you've you've clearly like have a lot of experience with that. I always think of that as one kind of platform or medium where you're if you make a mistake, especially yeah. if you're looping live in front of an audience, it's like yeah. on repeat it's so totally exposed yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you clearly have spent a lot of time um yeah practicing that, that either on your you know on your computer or with pedals or or whatever. Yeah, it's, um, that's how I kind of started with, with, I was, I bought a loop station and I learned a beatbox and, and I started writing my own hip hop songs that way. And, and then we found the band and for a long time, I'd never used a loop station at all. Um, but then, but then I, you know, there's times when you couldn't get the full band or like, it just, you know, it, it just certain gigs lent itself more to solo performances mm -hmm. or, you know, whether it has to do with pay or, you know, logistics, like sometimes like you can just perform by yourself. And, and I liked the aspect of doing live again, playing live rather than playing to a backing track. I think, I think it, it gives it more, you know, more richness you know in, um in a live performance but yeah it is more difficult and it is <laughs> you really have to be on it and i i guess i i'm someone who likes to be challenged in that way so um so i keep doing it and it's worked out for me it's it's odd sometimes and um but i don't know i think it's made me a better musician in the end to, to learn how to loop and and um yeah, and be on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I remember when that um, the you know that the line six DL four that big green pedal that everybody loves and knows. And yeah. I remember when that came out and like in high school that was the only looper that I could afford or even knew about, and it was like oh yeah, it was pretty important for just you know playing over chord changes and just well, practicing. Yeah, to kind of practice alone. by yourself and mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. And so a lot of the, the, the um, you know, uh, looping and, and improvising that you're doing right now, is that mostly with a, a loop station or do you do 
um, anything with with Ableton or that sort of thing? I haven't, much, I haven't worked into Ableton all that. I want to be able to, but I've gotten so daunted by that, the feeling of um, not being, uh, yeah, I don't know. I get, I get easily daunted when I stare at software programs. I'm like, I feel like that's a whole nother, another ball game of thing, stuff to learn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I've like kind of, I've, I've been leaving some of the producing work up to like people, engineers I've been working with and, um, but eventually I want to learn and to use Ableton, but I haven't messed around with that quite a, quite a bit. So it's either me, either me looping or just working with live uh, instrumentalists and, mm. and this works well. I love, I love playing with, with other musicians and, um, I love hopping in with different bands. I, I get invited to play with random bands sometimes. And I love doing that. Just jump it in. And... You know, I was taking a listen to your record, which I think is from 2017, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, the D-Mills and the Thrill record? With D-Mills and the Thrills. Yeah, I and I just, I was really kind of fascinated by the arrangements on there, which were, you know, based on my very limited experience with hip hop. Um, mm -hmm. And spoken word, just like really ornate with all the what kind of textures that I wouldn't associate yeah. with it too, like horns and, um, yeah. you know, the guitar parts and everything. Everything seemed very... Yeah. I mean, I want it... I, I mean, D-Mills and the Thrills was definitely like a... Like every musician in that band or all people that I admired aesthetically, like that I liked. I like the textures I like they use and I think what what made us work as a band is that we all contributed our own like selves to it and so it made it authentic um which is can can be hard to do it can be hard when you have so many personality clashes people want to do this people want to do this but like for sure like a thing like a, a mantra of mine like when when I was this is the it was like really the first full band ever ever led before and but um but my, when I, but something that i always wanted to run with was um like well okay well, like let me work with these musicians i want like i want them to bring what they have to the table you know um as much as i can you know mm -hmm. of course um there's certain things there are certain ideas we all had that we wanted to push for and our ideas wouldn't always line up, but like, um, but yeah, every player in that band has their own authentic, beautiful sound and they're all very talented musicians. And um, I felt really lucky to be surrounded by them. Um, How did yeah. the, the kind of like two vocal arrangements come up, come about? Cause it seems like, um, the other vocalist in the group would would come in and sing these these kind of very like catchy hook kind of uh, yeah. chorus parts, and then you'll do your spoken word during the verse. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was a really interesting, yeah, vocal texture too that I hadn't heard. Yeah, she's uh, yeah. That Andy is the name of hers. Uh, she's she has a background in jazz singing, but she loves indie rock. She loves hip hop. She grew up on a lot of like nineties hip-hop that i love so we have we have that um similar like taste and it turns out we can blend and harmonize really well together so i like love her singing voice and um yeah so i mean a lot of these i write the melodies and lyrics and and um and yeah i wanted i wanted d mills to be a an original band like that we had our own sound but i wanted it also to have an accessibility to it and that's where you know the you know the catchy melodies come in those kind of things and that's where you know performing covers that people know come in like bringing people to us bringing people in being like oh hey you know this is we're familiar we also are appreciators of this style of music and I know that there are other people who love this kind of music as well. So let's bring them into what we have to offer and, and then also show them what we can write ourselves. And when it worked, it worked really, you know, worked nicely. And 
Yeah. Yeah, it's um, cool. I I also really appreciate that you uh, on many of the songs you list the lyrics below or yeah, I can't remember if it was on if it was on the YouTube videos or, or if it was actually on Spotify. But um, yeah, just because it, it for somebody like me who's definitely an outsider to the <laughs> genre, it's and you're you know your spoke your rapping is like so quick and rapid fire that it kind of takes for me it takes repeated listenings to. <laughs> To catch so, on to catch the lyrics yeah so i appreciate that you listed, listed yeah that. well um, and yeah the lyrics are such an important element especially in any rap song and i mean yeah a lot of what you hear is like is what is inspired by the words you know um and yeah they're i work i write really stream of conscious i read you know which is kind of what comes out of me um yeah, and I've always been um, a fan of creative writing, and um, so and with the, the hip hop element is is fun about what your creative writing is that you get to make creative rhythmic phrases and ideas with what your what the words you're writing, and so you get to it's it's wordplay, it's rhythmic play, it's like um, being a rapper is like being another percussive instrument. So, yeah, 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 it's, it's, yeah, I just, there was like a a parallel that came to my mind that seemed kind of out of left field, just like the way you land phrases, yeah, like maybe the word, the end of the phrase or the kind of the punchline, so to speak, that you want to highlight either falls Mm -hmm. like after something really syncopated or it falls in a very unexpected place. Yeah. Oh, I just cool. I was thinking about that and like, the, the, Good note. just the rhythmic element is so intense in a way, and it maybe is what. So it made me think of one of like almost like Indian classical music, where there's this component of how you you're playing a complicated phrase, um, and then how you land it is really important to the audience. So like, you can be really creative mm-hmm. or even mathematical with it, but yeah um it was just kind of a, a tangent that i thought I, of listening I to it. it that's like cool uh nuances yeah i um i definitely i mean when i'm writing that's definitely something i try to keep in mind does it sound good how does it how can i make this like how can i make this thought provoking how can i make this um land good how can i make this creative and have have my own voice and yeah, I like I like adding complexity. I like adding as um, as much as I can, showing skill, showing because yeah, I'm um, I can rap almost anything. I'm I'm I I'm not gonna say I'm the fastest rapper ever. <laughs> like there, I can rap fast, but I know like there are people who can rap miles faster than me and are have way more like just crazy diction like. But yeah, I mean, you give me any like rap artist that raps, you know, and I can pick it up. And, and that's kind of how I learned to rap is like by, by, you know, I hear like a rap that I just love and go crazy about. And it's not necessarily something you just pick up. You actually have to sit down and look at the lyrics and mm. you have to dissect it. I, I think about that when I've, um, put on tributes. I mean, I've, I'm well known for doing tributes to Rage Against the Machine and Zach De La Rocha is definitely an MC. And, and for me to get to, to be able to recite and be able to do it without a script in front of me is by re- repetition, 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 and actually going through and looking at the words and searing them in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, once they're there, they're there. Like they don't leave like, um, like some of them will just always be stuck in my memory. Like some of them that I don't, some of the Rage Against the Machine songs that I don't only played once, I might not remember as well, but like, but yeah, I can easily just recite lyrics of theirs on a dime. Um, but yeah, it's just like, it's nice. It just kind of sticks in, in my head. I have, I get a lot of people that ask me like, how do you remember all those lyrics? It's just like, well, first, you, it takes an enormous amount of repetition, but then it's like, <laughs> it's not, it's not like a walk in the park. It isn't. It's like, it takes work to get there. It takes practice. Um, 
but it's all valuable and it's worth it, you know? So. Right. It seems like there's that muscle memory component and also that it, it can. like, I think people kind of have this perception coming from the outside that like, Oh, did, did you just do that spontaneously? <laughs> it's like, no, it didn't happen by accident. Like clearly uh -huh. worked on that for a long time. Yeah. Exactly. Or even if, if it if something was improvised, it seems like, um, yeah, one, one mm -hmm. quick thought that I had too was, was, um, just relating to rage against the machine and, um, kind of thinking about, I don't think about protest music in a way. Um, I don't know if that's, if that's a genre that you would, you know, like, I don't know if you consider any of the music that you write protest music in a sense, but I'm just kind of curious about mm -hmm. this idea of like, you know, we're in this kind of crazy moment and, and we've had, um, you mm -hmm. know, George Floyd's murder and we've had protests and just everything is yeah, kind of up in the air, but also exposed, I think, to an audience that was maybe, you know, just not aware of it or not paying attention for a long time. So I'm kind of yeah, I'm cu curious how you at this moment are relating like music making, um, if that's with lyrics or instrumentally to like actually creating change in a, in a community. Yeah. Well, that's kind of open ended, but um, you know, just curious about that. I think it's almost within an artist's nature to, to take their music and hope that it like instills change or it's doing something that's like productive and progressive. And it's funny cause it's like, Rage Against the Machine is the definition of a politically charged, but not everybody realizes that as they, you know. Um, but it's funny because like, you, I, I don't know, I see writers as prophets a lot. And like, like if you're a songwriter and you're, it sticks, it's like it's a lot of times you can see back into the future, like looking look behind and be like, oh yeah, like what, this is what they were, this is exactly what they were talking about. Like, I think that a lot about Bob Dylan songs, like, um, I, you know, the words, how does it feel, <laughs> you know, um, when you've been robbed of something, your dignity, when you've been robbed of, um, or just like when you're finally like facing the outcome of, of, of your, um, bad behavior or your mistakes or whatever you want to call it. Um, music is such a beautiful outlet for um, giving audiences um, direction or like uh, solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, and like I found, I find solidarity in, when I sing Rage Against the Machine and and, and artists and um, and yeah, I, I think definitely like some of my music is not necessarily centrally focused like the way that uh, Rage Against Machine is, and, and then it, you know, there's there's without a doubt elements of of um, activism within my own. I mean, just who I am is you know, as an, as a woman in doing this thing that's just totally dominated by men, you know, mm -hmm. rap music, of course, and then music, the music scene is, is dominated by men too, you know? And so in, in, in itself, me just being on a stage is a politi political statement. Um, so I'm, I'm aware of that. And and I'm aware that people look up to me for those reasons. Um, that that when people see me doing that, they're inspired, and like that's one of the reasons why I keep doing what I do is because I know that I know that it's making a positive difference, and I know that it's like <laughs> it helps people see things a little bit differently. That it's not necessarily always this certain way. I like to yeah that it kind of challenges people's beliefs about who belongs where, who belongs on a stage, like who can play the guitar, who can, mm -hmm. who can rap. Um, yeah. And I, it, 
I mean, coming from a city like Fargo, North Dakota, which is, you know, in North Dakota, which is a really conservative state. Um, yeah, it's no, I mean, I face challenges, of course, you know, being a, being an MC and trying to like promote this rap band in, <laughs> in, in North Dakota. Mostly we're very well beloved and like we, you know, um, but yeah, there's, there's always haters, you know, and there's just always people that try to put you down and right. plan. I haven't been shy or I haven't, <laughs> I have had my fair share of people who try to put me down and it only like once makes you want to create and write even more sometimes. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm curious in this moment about, you know, what, what our, our local music scene is going to look like in, in five years or, yeah, um, I think we kind of, in a way, because of COVID, we have this opportunity to, to just pause and, and kind of reevaluate our communities. Yeah. Way. So I, I just, yeah, I appreciate you being out there and, and doing that and also um, just finding all the the acts that you do for for you know booking at Ice House and, and uh, other venues and just kind of thank you being somebody who's yeah you know kind of helping helping shape or create the scene so yeah I know it's a big role to play and you know <laughs> it's I, I take my job seriously, that's for sure. And I really enjoy it. It's a challenge for sure, but um, but yeah, it's, it's important. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm trying to pay attention as close as I can to the state of food community and, and um, be mindful of the ways that I can help best, you know? <laughs> Use my talents for good. <laughs> because I love this community. It's a community that I've looked up to for how many years? And, um, I mean, it's not far from Fargo, so it, ha it has quite the influence over Fargo, North Dakota. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Well, cool. Thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your day to, to chat. And do yeah. you, um, is there a, a place where people can look up um, the recording that you're working on or um, what your latest projects are? Um, What's the best I just place recommend online? following me on Instagram or, or Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. Diane Miller on Facebook or dmills.raps on Instagram. I kind of keep track. I share all my shows that I'm doing or, um, or my updates on stuff. Um, but, I mean, you can – my latest single is on YouTube. It's called What Gets Ignored. Mm -hmm. I released it um, this past January 1st. So, um but yeah, a lot. Otherwise, like D mills and the stuff stuff's pretty old. Um, you can find. I mean, there's stuff to enjoy about it, but it's very old. So um, I'm really trying to work on new stuff, and um, got some stuff on the way for sure. Awesome. Yeah, I'll put links to uh, to the single, the, the video, and and everything else uh, cool. when I finish this. So cool. I appreciate the interview. This is really nice. Yeah, it was great chatting with you. Yeah.